NFL Network presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number five. The Dallas Cowboys achieved the height of their popularity in the 1970s when they became known as America's Team. But by 1988, America's Team had become the worst team in the NFL. That season marked the end of an era, Tom Landry's 29-year run as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And we lost so much that season. We lost, and I, and I would cry after every loss. We just kept losing and losing and losing. And it seemed to me like everybody was okay with it. I would cry, guys would walk by and say, hey, don't worry about it, you know, pick up a check Tuesday. Clearly, the culture in Dallas needed to change. And on February 25th, 1989, Arkansas businessman Jerry Jones purchased the Cowboys from Bum Bright. He promised to rebuild America's team. I just want to say this. <laughs> There is no substitute for winning. I know that's a cliche, but we must win. We will win. Win is the name of the game. Jones dismissed Landry, a very unpopular move at the time, and replaced him with former college teammate Jimmy Johnson. Landry had been so successful for so many years, I don't think anybody considered there being a life after Tom Landry. I know that... There could have been better circumstances as far as me coming into this position. But I would hope that people would be as excited about this organization, about this football team, as what I am. Johnson had never coached at the pro level, but he won a college championship with the Miami Hurricanes in 1988. His star receiver at Miami was number 47, Michael Irvin. I had won a championship with Jimmy Johnson. So, Jimmy did call me and say to me, I'm coming into Dallas. I pulled out that list of everybody that told me, don't worry about it, long as you pick up the let check. And I said, Jimmy, he has to go, he has to go, he, he's not here to win, he's not here to win. I knew once we made that change, things would change. On about, let's go, Mike, go! The problem for Johnson was that the team he inherited simply wasn't very good. Welcome to Valley Ranch, Coach. <laughs> it was a roster short on self-starters like Michael Irvin and number 40, Bill Bates. But Johnson and Jones had an opportunity to remake the franchise with the number one pick in the 1989 draft. Their target was UCLA quarterback Troy Aikman, but that was nothing new. Johnson tried to recruit Aikman out of high school, and then again two years later when Aikman decided to transfer from Oklahoma. Both times, Johnson failed. After turning Jimmy Johnson down twice, I have no choice in this one if they select me. And I didn't know how bad the Cowboys were, uh, and I didn't know how good Jimmy ultimately was. I just knew that, man, this thing keeps coming back. I guess it's just fate. I'm going to play for Jimmy Johnson. That summer, Aikman got his first glimpse of life under Jimmy Johnson. Be under control. Be under control. Keep those hands up. Look at me. Look at me. I can't. So we showed up for that last camp, and we had a running test. And one of our players, one of our young players, had asthma. 
and made it through about halfway through the running drill and just collapsed. And Jimmy said he could never win with a guy that's not conditioned because he used to always say fatigue will make a coward of you. And so Jimmy, who was really on a tirade that entire day anyway, got in this guy's face and, and wanted to know what the problem was. You know, he'd had three or four months to prepare for this, this running test, and, and uh, the young player said that he had asthma. And Jimmy quickly directed him over to the asthma field, and uh, he never played a snap for the Dallas Cowboys. He kind of made us all feel like if, uh, if we didn't do our job, that someone else was going to do it for us. Get some run support now today, huh, Kenny? Yeah. Working down. Start Let's filling those lanes a little bit. Yeah, I've got to change my footwork now. Oh, you'll get it. He was like, I love you as long as you're making tackles. As soon as you stop making tackles, I don't love you anymore. <laughs> you know? To Johnson, it was natural selection. The sick and the weak were left behind. And older veterans like Randy White and Danny White were forced to retire. The end result was a team high on enthusiasm but low on talent. A team that would lose 15 games in 1989. The rebuilding of America's team had just begun. In Dallas, the 1989 season got off to a horrible start. The young Cowboys had trouble finding their way, and they dropped their first five games. Don't worry about this. You can't go now. We'll do it again some other time, baby. Jimmy Johnson realized his young team was going nowhere fast. So on October 13th, he and owner Jerry Jones made a move that would alter the course of the franchise. They traded their only Pro Bowl player, running back Herschel Walker. I find out that we had just traded the only guy that we had on our team that was really any good. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I don't know what we're going to get, uh, what players we're going to receive. Uh, I don't know where our offense is going right now or what, you know, what you're going to see on Sunday. In return for Walker, the Cowboys received five journeyman players, but more importantly, seven high draft picks. One agent said uh, it's the biggest trade he has ever seen in the NFL. As one other, uh, one owner said it's a, a great train robbery. But whatever it is, we're happy with it. I couldn't understand it at the time, and I'm glad they viewed it differently because that certainly, you know, got us over the hump in a hurry. Walker accomplished little in two and a half seasons in Minnesota, while the Cowboys' bounty of draft picks became the foundation for a dynasty. In 1990, the first of those picks was used to select Walker's replacement, Emmett Smith. And I remember the first walking in with the MC Hammer type pants, and I thought, what do we get this guy? I was like, man, this is a small guy. But when he took that football field, it was like he turned into Superman. He was an incredible talent. Let the mind control the body, not the body controlling the mind. Right, Emmett? That's it. Johnson had a keen eye for talent, and his number one goal in the draft was to improve team speed. I got you there. Boom! All right. You know I'll let you do that. What we're really looking for is speed and quickness. Hunt, hunt. Good right there, backside. All right, good job, Nick. Good quickness there. Good quickness. In just two years, the Cowboys were transformed from old and slow to young and fast, and they started to win. Smith up the middle, bounces at the 10, to the 5, cut to the right, cut to the left. Oh, Touchdown. no! Evan Smith. Oh, yes, yes! Unbelievable run! But did you like it? The Cowboys went 7-9 and nine in 1990, and Jimmy Johnson was named Coach of the Year. 47 guys believing, 47 guys hanging in there for four quarters. Hey, super, super job, because you could have gotten down you know, when they got on top of you, and you could have said, oh, here it goes again. But it, those days are over with. In 1991, Dallas improved to 11-5 and, and won a playoff game. All the pieces were in place for a Cowboys run in 1992. 
Emmett was driving home, I think. And he just called to say, I love you, man. And we are going to do this next year. And I said, yeah. Yes, we are. You know, the season's over. And everybody's ready to scatter and get away from football. And all we were thinking about, man, I can't wait the next year to get started. There's no doubt we saw what we could be that early. In the spring of 1992, the Cowboys made a huge addition to their defense. They acquired Pro Bowl defensive end Charles Haley in a trade with the San Francisco 49ers. Charles came into our team already having two Super Bowls. That was something that we couldn't even imagine what a Super Bowl was like. Charles Haley really made the difference for our football team in, in raising the expectation for all of us of what it took to be a champion. All right, Charles. All right, Charles, that's your play all the way now. But there was a reason the 49ers were willing to part with him. Psycho problems. He's crazy. Charles, it, Charles is crazy for real, <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, what you ought to do? You ought to call timeout. Don't go to neither side. I go in the middle of the damn field. Get down on both knees and Lord help me, please. <laughs> He'll walk up to you and kind of punch you. He'll grab you in your private area, <laughs> you know, and just kind of uh, just kind of pull you around. He just does things to aggravate you. Where the dog him? Why do you use him as a piss boy? Uh, the great thing about Charles Haley was that it didn't matter who you were. He was going to ride you pretty hard. George, I hit your mother <laughs> and real my up on you and call you my <laughs> He wanted to see who could take it and who couldn't take it. Emmett want to try to joke you, Kevin. Let's joke Emmett. And God forbid you showed any sign of weakness because he was going to be on you for the rest of the season. Haley pushed the young Cowboys, and despite their youth, the team was relaxed and confident heading into the 92 season. Oh, oh Michael, two hands. Don't be cute. Don't be pretty, be good. That's right, two hands counts the same as one hand. I mean, it was funny because, you know, most of the things you read, like uh, Dallas may be a year away. And we were like, what are they talking about? If you went through the year virtually injury free and did not make the playoffs, would that be a crushing blow? It won't happen, we, you know, we'll be in the playoffs. That swagger was tested on opening day against the defending champion, Washington Redskins. I remember walking in, and, and, and Jimmy would always talk about it, man. He said it many a times. When you're fighting a gorilla, you walk up to that gorilla, and you bust him in the mouth. In their first two games, the Cowboys defeated the Redskins and the Giants, the last two Super Bowl champions. Deep ball left side, caught it, Aaron, spinning away over at the 15 to the 10, toward the goal line. Touchdown, oh, 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 Michael Irvin. Hey, hey, super job of believing, just like what we talked about in practice, when you ever go after a big gorilla, you don't ever hit him lightly. You hit him with everything you got. Yeah! After beating the beasts of the East, the Cowboys found it difficult to get up for the lowly Cardinals. That was before cornerback Lorenzo Lynch talked trash to Michael Irvin. This was little baby Arizona. We were ready to play, but Lynch really helped out a lot. We go get him. We go beat him up. He came walking by. Hey, Michael, what's up? What's up, man? I'm here. I'm going to be here all day. I'm going to be on you all day. And I was like, okay, Arizona's in town. Thank you for waking me up. I appreciate that. Second play of the game. Boop. Quick out. Throws the ball out. Nice catch. Irvin on the left side. Line the the 25. I go 87 yards for a touchdown. And Irvin to the 25. I'm running, looking for a lynch. Where were you, buddy? I 
thought you were going to be with me. I laid into this guy all game long. Now I go back and I catch another touchdown. Deep ball on a hitch to Urban, and it's caught. Touchdown. Thank you very much yet again. I ended up catching three touchdowns. I had like 200 yards or something. And I was like, tell your coach to get you out of this game. You're getting killed in here. If you were on another team, you probably did not like Michael Irvin because he was so demonstrative out on the field. He just really would rub it in whenever he made a play. What I do? Make plays. Nothing but make plays, baby. I played against Michael in college uh, when I was at OU and he was at the University of Miami, and I wasn't real crazy about Michael Irvin. But I will tell you, you could not have a better teammate. He showed up every day in practice as if he was running routes in Super Bowls. He was competitive. He challenged guys. He wanted the ball at the end of the game. Third down, just get me the rock. I don't care what play, get me the rock, I'll take care. He was the emotional lightning rod of our team. We're not letting each other down. We're not letting each other down. Not this one, right? Let's go, everybody, let's go. Dallas won five of its first six games, propelled by its star-studded threesome on offense. Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, and Michael Irvin. When Michael, Troy, and Emmett were in the heyday, we all got a spot on that bench and watched that big jumbotron. We were getting our water, but we were peeking up, watching to see what they were doing, because we knew they were doing something special. Aikman handoff, Smith coming right. Trying to outrun the coverage, makes a cut. Gets it, oh, he's still going, oh, he's going to He's going to score, he's got the five. It's a touchdown, Emmett oh, Smith. Oh, absolutely ridiculous. It should never have happened, but Emmett Smith does the impossible. The Cowboys had the league's leading rusher, second leading receiver, and the third highest rated passer, all on the same team. There have been plays where I've run a route and I couldn't see the ball. And I put my hands up and the ball hit me right in the hands. And I'm telling you, if I closed my eyes to run 10 routes. I believe eight of them would have hit me right in the hands. It couldn't have been thrown any better. Together they were known as the triplets, and they helped make the Cowboys America's team again. In 1992, the Cowboys' popularity grew with every win. The Cowboys are back. Showtime. Every game was a show, and every player a showman. How else to explain number 29, Kenny Gant, a special teams player from tiny Albany State, who became known as the Shark. Wasn't that, wasn't that awesome? The kickoff team would line up on the 50-yard uh, line. And Kenny Gant would be all the way back in the end zone, back there doing his little shark. By about the third game, they're playing shark music. Doo -doo, doo -doo. It became a phenomenon. He would get hit sometimes, not make a tackle, still get up and do his shark thing. You know, I said, Kenny, you just got busted in the mouth. But he took that spotlight and ran with it. By week eight, the Cowboys were the main event. 91,000 fans packed the normally half-empty L.A. Coliseum, many rooting for Dallas. I can't believe it. Look at all that blue up there. Not moving either. <laughs> like, it's, this is America's team, you know, and we were coming back to what made it America's team. Putting it back on that pedal scoop where it belonged. At six and one, the young cowboys were on top of the world. Uh, went home getting that Mercedes, convertible Mercedes. Then back to the um, top, kick up the music, and smile all the way down the highway. I used to say we're, we're like the Beatles traveling. Stuff like coming home from a game, on the road, going to my house. 
and, and people are at your house. Women are in your house. What is this? I'm a big fan of yours, and you, where's your clothes? What are you doing? You know, it got to being like a traveling rock band. In fact, during the 1992 season, 11 different Cowboys had their own weekly television or radio program. So many years where the Cowboys have been at the... Hello and welcome again to the Jimmy Johnson Show. My name is... You'd be better served naming the guys that didn't have one. You know, we had a number of guys that, that took advantage of their celebrity, I guess you could say. Troy Aikman was one of those celebrities. As the quarterback of America's team, he was a natural draw. Troy even appeared in a country music video with the band Shenandoah. I didn't sing in that, but uh, I did sing on a, on a, uh, I wish I had enough, but I did sing on a country uh, CD. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Driving down 66, this old pickup truck can me. Your memory. We all knew that Troy couldn't sing. But anytime you can throw that ball the way that you throw it and win the games the way you do, all of a sudden your voice sounds a whole lot better. You still think of Oklahoma nights. And you know, the great thing about it was Jimmy, he was fine with all that. Jimmy wanted guys loose, he wanted them confident, he wanted them uh, out having fun and you know, Lord knows he was, so uh, <laughs> I think that was key. Johnson gave his stars a little leeway, but not regarding the schedule. Michael Irvin learned this lesson when he arrived late for a team flight to Detroit in week 10. The plane trip. Yeah, I missed the plane. <laughs> we were scheduled to depart, I believe, at 12 o'clock, and they said, well, we don't have everybody, and Jimmy said, who's not here? They said, Michael Irvin's not here. He said, shut the door, we're leaving. Uh, they said, well, he just pulled up in the parking lot. He's on his way to the plane now. He said, I said, shut the door. We're taking off. And uh, that was that. We had just left Michael out on the tarmac. You know, we knew that Michael was going to get there, but Jimmy was uh, extremely upset. He was hot. You can always tell when he's hot, he can't stop moving his lip like, Michael, you're one of my star players. I'm disappointed in you. And you're not starting. Michael's punishment was sitting out the first series, which was three plays and a punt, and then he was right back out on the field. Because one thing about Jimmy, <laughs> he knew when a player could help us win and he was going to get him out on the field, and then we were going to deal with the punishment later in the week. Irvin played and helped the Cowboys improve to 8-1. and one. Deep ball. Oh, man, is this man wide open. Irvin caught it at the 15, to the 5. Stretches over the goal line. Touchdown, Michael Irvin. Jimmy Johnson would have to work twice as hard to keep his young team focused in the second half of the season. Well, this is why you play the game. You play in games to find out who are the contenders and who are the pretenders. The Cowboys were definitely contenders, and they were making it look easy. They beat the Cardinals and Broncos and blew out the Giants on Thanksgiving. To the 10, Smith for the goal line. Come on, Emmett Smith. Happy Thanksgiving, Emmett. This one's over. They were getting fat on success, and it finally caught up with them in Washington. Oh, man. Well, it's going to be a wild one today, I have a feeling. At 11 and 2, Dallas blew a chance to seal the NFC East title. Pass. He's in the end zone. He gets the ball batted, gets grabbed, sacked there. Same grabbed in the end zone. The ball still loose. Grabbed by the, the defense. What's Mike, the call? Might be a touchdown for the Red Seas. It is. Touchdown. Watching the Redskins defense. On the plane ride home, Jimmy Johnson felt the players weren't taking the loss as hard as he was. It was one of those flight homes that you better not say a word, you better not make a noise, because you just might not be here tomorrow. And he walked back and he jumped on. I don't know what I was doing, he jumped on me. Sit down, Michael, don't you move. He just went crazy, you know? He was just all in my face, and I wasn't quite sure how to do it, you know? No one talks to you like that unless they're your dad. See, that, that's, you can't lose here. 
Jimmy made it so uncomfortable losing. They made it miserable. In the regular season finale against Chicago, Johnson kept the pressure on despite a Cowboys blowout. Cowboys had wrapped up 13 wins, the most in franchise history. But a sloppy fourth quarter, including two fumbles by Emmett's backup, Kervin Richards, put the head coach in a foul mood. Kervin Richard fumbled, Jimmy grabs him. Don't you fumble this ball again. You fumble this ball again, or you know, and, and, and he goes and fumble again. We have this game won. We kill Chicago, but Jimmy's still serious. No letting down here. He cut the guy the next day. And Kervin, you have to pay him. He'll get his ring. But Jimmy was sending a message. It's not to be taken lightly. Johnson wanted his players focused, and he drove that point home in the locker room where Jerry Jones had invited a special guest, Saudi Arabian ambassador, Prince Bandar bin Sultan. So we finished 13-3. and three. It was the best in the history of the Dallas Cowboys. And Jimmy was all set to give us uh, that speech that we as players really wanted to hear. And about the time he started into it, the door opened up to the locker room, and it was Jerry Jones walking in with Prince Bandar. Jimmy just kind of dropped his head and stopped, and he said, uh, it's been a nice season. Uh, we'll see you next week. I remember meeting the Prince and everything, but I didn't have a problem with it. I love that Jerry was that proud of his football team. I love that he wanted to show them off. I love that he wanted to be around us. I love that it mattered to him. I still love that about him now. Both men wanted the same thing, a Dallas championship. And it was there for the taking at the start of the playoffs. Cowboy defense, y'all don't forget about them boys, okay? Don't forget about us, please. All season, the Cowboys' top-ranked defense was largely overlooked. That didn't change when the league announced its Pro Bowl selections. Six members of the Dallas offense made it, none from the defense. We were the number one defense in the rank. We were sacking folks, we were chasing teams down. No one could run on us, so the Pro Bowl announcements, it was just ridiculous. The defense used the Pro Bowl snub as fuel for the playoffs. It was the Cowboys' first postseason game in Texas in nearly 10 years, and Ken Norton Jr. made the most of it. We're not getting too many chances, baby. We're not getting too many chances. Let's do it. It's amazing when you call a defensive huddle and we all know that we're kicking their butts <laughs> and we just kind of look at each other with a certain sense of accomplishment. We're letting the Eagles know we're back now. They better stop us. Hey, they better worry about us. Out of the shotgun, Cunningham chased by Jeff Show them something today. How come we still have no defense? Number one defense in the league. How come we still Number have no one defense? defense in the league. Dallas Cowboy defense, unconscious. <laughs> hey, super, super job. You are one game away from the Super Bowl. Yeah! To get to the Super Bowl. Dallas would have to win on the road against the San Francisco 49ers, a team that lost only two games during the season. Oh, here's my moment. Championship game, San Francisco, matched up against Cherry Rice. I had that fella there in my locker in college. I dreamed of playing opposite of him in a game of this magnitude. Roger Staubach was there to go out onto the field for the coin toss, as was some other former players. And I remember visiting with Staubach before the game and 
and asking him how he felt. And uh, he said, I, I'm so nervous, I feel like I need to get my ankles taped, you know? And, and I'm thinking to myself, good gosh, I mean, if, if he's not even playing. I mean, how am I supposed to feel right now? Troy Aikman found his resolve, and the Cowboys jumped on top of the favored 49ers. What many saw as a free pass to the Super Bowl for the Niners, the Cowboys viewed as a passing of the torch. Steve Young up under center, strike drop, what pressure coming, steps away, throws it, intercepted by Norton. And Ken Norton Jr., the leading tackler on the leading defense, comes away with the ball. We know that you guys are a lot of tradition and history, but it's over now. It's our turn. Cowboys' coronation would have to wait. The 49ers drove 93 yards to pull within four points, and there was still over four minutes left. And now Jimmy Johnson's offense has got to make a couple of first downs. The Cowboys might not only need to burn time, they might need points, Brad. Our offensive coordinator, Norv, asked Jimmy, you know, how do you want to approach this? Do you want to try to take time off the clock? and be conservative, or do you, you know, want to throw the football here? And uh, typical <laughs> Jimmy, without really answering the question, just said, I want to score. And so, <laughs> OK, well, that's all Norv had to hear. So on first down, you know, we called a 896 F flat. We've got a post on one side and a curl on the other. Michael was the, had been the guy running the post route. But every time we had called it, I had pretty much thrown the ball to the curl to Alvin Harper. So here we are, I call 896 F flat. And by the time 89, before he got six out, I've already taken off out of the huddle and I'm headed to Alvin's spot. Forget this, Alvin. I'm going over here to catch this curl route. I'm thinking, hey man, this game on the line. I'm the one more ready for this than anybody. 414 to play at this football game and the Cowboys come out. So I get underneath the center, and I see that the 49ers are showing blitz. And I know that because of the blitz, the post is really where the ball should go. And he snaps the ball. And I come off the line, I remember I run the route, I hook up, and I'm looking for the ball. He threw the ball backside to Alvin Harper. Alvin Harper sprinting up the football field with my football. And I dreamed about this moment, looking at me sprinting up the football, and I was like, man, you blew it. You blew it. Harper's got the 20! Harper's got the 10-yard line! Wow! Oh, I want to play. <laughs> my goodness, what a play. Michael was just he, as happy as he was that we made this big play. He was just sick, thinking that that should have been his ball. But what's interesting is I don't know that we get the same coverage if Michael had been the guy over there running that route. Blue 88! Hot, hot! An Aikman touchdown pass to Kelvin Martin sealed the win and the NFC Championship. Touchdown! Touchdown, Cowboys! This team's going to Pasadena. The Cowboys are going to a Super Bowl. That was a great feat. You believed you can do it but you can't believe this moment's happened. You're going to the Super Bowl. Man, we are actually going to a Super Bowl. No, no. Hey, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Every single one of you. Excuse me. I mean, I'm, and I'm not just talking about these last 60 minutes. I'm talking about the quarterback schools, the mini camps, the training camp. Everybody, you did one hell of a job. And all the only thing else I got to say is, how about them Cowboys? Yeah! He said it, and we just, we just roared, you know? How about them Cowboys? 
those of us who are in the lean years will remember the 1 in 15s and the Redskins and the Giants and the Eagles just killing us and saying, you know, the Cowboys are nothing. And all of a sudden, Coach broke out with, How about them Cowboys? Yeah! How about those Cowboys now, you know? That's what he's really saying. How you like us now? Troy Aikman had a near perfect day, completing 13 of 16 passes in the second half. But Jimmy Johnson proved once again that no star is more important than the team. There were a number of interviews that I was asked to do following that game against the 49ers, and so I was trying to accommodate as many people as I could. And I finally got showered up, and I went to go get on the bus, and the bus is pulling out and leaving. Jimmy, like he had done with Michael Irvin earlier in the season, he's, they said, Coach, Troy's not on the bus. He says, I don't care. Shut the door. We're out of here. I mean, we won the NFC Championship game. We're going to the Super Bowl, and Jimmy still wouldn't wait for me. I had to ride the media bus to go get back onto the plane. The Dallas Cowboys had two weeks to prepare for Super Bowl 27 in the Rose Bowl. Plenty of time to get ready for the Buffalo Bills and plenty of time to soak up the limelight. We were a Hollywood. First of all, we thought we were a Hollywood team anyway. And now we are actually in Hollywood, man. We had a great week. They were Hollywood in Hollywood, dressed like Miami Vice. But this was all new to Dallas. The Bills had been to the Super Bowl the last two years, and many thought their experience would win out over the Cowboys' youth. They've been there two times, but uh, I wouldn't call losing twice an advantage. I think we were so excited that we beat the 49ers. I think that was kind of our Super Bowl game. The fact that we beat the great 49ers with Jerry Rice and Steve Young, we beat that team. Who were the Buffalo Bills? <laughs> you know, we beat the 49ers. The players fantasized about their Super Bowl moment. It's a wobbly pass. It's picked off by the shark. <laughs> but nothing could prepare them for the moment when Super Bowl Sunday finally arrived. When we hit that tunnel and those 100,000 people, and they were right here. It seemed like that whole stadium was right here. It's like my knees slipped. They just buckled. Oh, you got a butterfly for some reason. That's big, right? It is big. It's off the right eye, Oh, yeah. It's a lot of damn people, huh? I looked at him. I said, did you feel that? He said, yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Because we knew, if they knew, we were nervous. <laughs> and the whole football team was in trouble. Let's get getting what they come to see. The Cowboys quarterback from UCLA, number eight, Troy Aikman. When I was introduced and, and ran out of the tunnel, I had this wave of emotion and really what this game was all about and how different it was. In the biggest game of his career, Troy Aikman delivered an MVP performance. I've ever seen a quarterback throw like Troy threw that day. It was like no one is going to stop this from happening. Aikman passed for 273 yards and four touchdowns, two of them to Michael Irvin. break out of it early. I was anxious. It was Super Bowl, I was nervous. And I saw Troy getting ready to throw the ball. Now, if I see him throwing the ball, then I would imagine the DB seeing him, because he's turning and running. And I was like, oh, man, I messed up. If 
he gets in here and intercepts his ball, it's 99 yards to the end zone. So as I jumped up, I threw my leg up to try to shield this guy away from the ball. And all I can remember thinking, when I landed, just launched towards the end zone. I was early, but it made it a beautiful play. <laughs> it made it a beautiful play, man, and until this day. I love seeing that play. The Cowboys' defense, overshadowed all year, never gave Buffalo a chance. Ken Norton knocked Jim Kelly out of the game in the second quarter, and the defense forced a Super Bowl record nine turnovers. I don't think we ever thought in our wildest dreams that we would get that many turnovers. Uh, we were fortunate enough to recover them, score, and keep scoring. In the end, the only mistake the Cowboys made was celebrating a little too early. It's a sack by Jeff Moore. And fumble. And Leon left. Oh, it's out of the way. Oh, look out. Here he goes. Here oh, comes Leon. Oh, to the 20. Go oh, Leon. Oh, Leon. Oh, it's a fumble. It's a fumble. It's a fumble. He had it knocked out of his hand. It's not going to be a touchdown. No, it's not. Leon came to the sideline. And I said, man, what happened? He said he was watching the Jumbotron, and he was trying to do Michael Irvin, where he put the ball out across the goal line. And he did see Don Beebe. Don Beebe caught him from behind and knocked it out of his hand. Oh, Leon! Hey, look at him. And at the time, it would have been a Super Bowl record for points. For 52 of them, it's hard to be upset about that. <laughs> at that point, we were so happy because we realized what had happened. We were going to be champs. The Cowboys are back on top of the mountain now. They were there in the 70s, fell off in the 80s. They're back on top now, and they should stay there a while. Wow. What a ride it's been. Troy Aikman's the MVP. Jimmy Johnson's taking his team from the absolute worst to the absolute best. Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson had reached the goal they set four years earlier. America's team was a champion again. For me, when you're a number one pick as a quarterback, you pretty much understand that that organization drafted you to, to win a world championship. I just remember thinking, no matter what happens, I came through and delivered what I was brought here to do. It was a great feeling and a great thing to be a part of. Parade. I don't think I've ever been a part of anything like that before. Confetti was all over the place. We had our jerseys on, and there were people everywhere. On the tallest buildings in Dallas, way up high, we could barely see them. They were raving, screaming, hey, Kenny. That parade was just special. football team. We all started at the bottom and we worked it all to the top together. People say, yeah, all of them are just as sweet. The second one was as sweet as the first and the third one was as sweet as the second. All of those are lies. There's nothing like the first one. Nothing. That was our first time saying we were champions. There's nothing like it. So the Super Bowl ends, and the team had a had a party. There were so many people there, uh, the sponsors and then their, their friends and people. And 
uh, that I couldn't, I, I, I didn't see any teammates. I, it was just a lot of people I didn't know that were, that were coming up and pictures and all that kind of stuff. And I said, man, I got I to get out of here. And so uh, I, I wasn't there very long. I got back to my room and uh, began calling, trying to reach my teammates. And then I uh, couldn't get a hold of anybody. And then I, so I said, well, I'll call my, my, my family. No answer. I'm leaving messages. And at that point, you know, everybody didn't have cell phones. So you were limited as far as how you're going to be able to reach everybody. And so now the biggest moment in my athletic career, I'm in my room uh, and I'd ordered up some beers and I'm having a beer and I'm thinking, this is, this is insane. I, I, I'm a world champion quarterback and I can't get a hold of anybody to have a beer with. Fortunately, we got back to other Super Bowls and uh, I made sure that, that everybody knew exactly where I was going to be and, the, and those that I wanted to celebrate those victories with me. When, when I was in Miami, we had just graduated Eddie Brown and Stanley Shakespeare, and we were starting, uh, we were starting spring practice. And Jimmy said he had a meeting. And he said, listen, he says, Eddie and Stanley are gone. He says, I'm looking for some new playmakers. We're going out here, and we will find some new playmakers. They're gone. Forget about them. And we went out to practice. And I had a great practice. I was catching everything. And Winston Moss stood up. He says, there's the playmaker right there. And from that point on, the name just stuck. The playmaker just made a major league play. The playmaker. What I do? Make plays. Nothing but make plays, baby. Give me an opportunity. Opportunity to make plays. Let's go. Bill Parcells wasn't coaching that year. And he did a game of ours early in the season. And so I was in production meetings with him. And I'd always been a big Bill Parcells fan and really respected what he had meant to that Giants organization. And, uh, and I asked him, and, and I'm not someone who asked many people for autographs, but when I was in the production meeting, I said, uh, you know, I'd really uh, appreciate it if you could give me your autograph. And, and he said, uh, you know, I don't really have anything with me. I don't want to just sign a piece of paper. Let me, let me when I get back home, let me sign something and I'll, I'll send it to you. And I said, hey, that'd be great. And then you don't know if you're really ever going to get it. But, you know, not much time had passed and I'd received a lithograph that he had signed. And it was when he was getting carried off the field after his last Super Bowl win with the New York Giants. And he said, I hope you get a ride like this one day. Uh, Bill Parcells. And I, I've still got it at my house. And uh, and little did I know that I would be getting that ride, uh, you know, just a few short months later. He talks all the time about, certainly I have a sliding scale. I, those guys that play great and make plays, I'd have them up here. He knew Emmett was going to work. He, he knew Troy would work. He knew I would work. And now there are other guys he knew he had to push. Let's go! We're waiting on you, Kenny! And he would come out on the practice field and he would, hey, what's up, Evan? How do you feel today? Oh, I, I feel pretty good. All right, give me all you got. Michael, what's, what's, how, how are you feeling today? It's a great day. I said, Coach, I, I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to play. And then, Nate, Nate, how do you feel today? Hey, Nate. Hey, Coach. How you feel? Well, Coach, my hammy, I don't want to hear about your hamstring. You get your big butt in gear and get ready to practice. And, you know, he, he handled every guy in, in a different way. He handled them how they needed to be handled to get the best out of them. You know, I was 0-11 as a starter. I mean, the team won one game, but I wasn't even the quarterback for that game. And so it, it was a very difficult year for me, never having experienced victory and not being accustomed to that. And we were playing the Phoenix Cardinals. In fact, that game, I wound up setting a, a NFL record for passing yardage for a rookie. But. At the very end of the game, I, we were down by three points. I threw a touchdown pass, and I got knocked out. I was out cold for about 10 minutes. Uh, and when I came around, Jimmy was leaning over me, and he said, you know, great pass. And, and I, I didn't even know what he was talking about. I didn't even remember throwing the ball. So I got up. I had blood coming out of my ear. I was able to look up at the scoreboard, and I see that, in fact, it was a touchdown. So I'm thinking I'm finally going to get to experience winning a game, only to have uh, the Cardinals go down the field and, and score and beat us uh, with very little time on the clock. And I remember walking off that field pretty much in a daze from the hit that I had received, 
and thinking, I don't know what it takes to win in this league, but I don't know that I'm ever going to win a football game. I wish my ass could flee. Yeah. I really don't think you understand what kind of hand I have. Dominoes was a big pastime in our locker room, and Charles was a big participant in those games, as was Emmett Smith. If you stayed this long, you would have got all A's in school, dog. Yeah, I know, but... Yeah, I believe that Kevin O'Neill, our trainer, he just got tired of the guys playing, uh, you know, the bickering and the fighting. Kevin, I, I guess, thought that it would be best to help get the focus back on the field by taking away the dominoes, and I just don't think that was a smart thing to do. Charles went off. He went off, and I, if I remember correctly, he tore up the whole training room, tore everything around in the training room. You throw away my domino, I'm throwing away this stuff. I'm like, Charles, we're going out here to take a beating. We're going to need this stuff when we get back in here. Why would you do something like that? See, I, I told Kevin O'Neill, I said, hey, he's a piece of work now. That's the kind of stuff Charles did. Charles was crazy, man. I love him. He's my brother. And he was crazy enough to get around those guys and get to the quarterback. But crazy he was. This was Denver, home of John Elway, the king of comebacks. I saw a little light in his eye. Man, he was shot. Zip, Jay Novacek, Michael, Zip, Jay Novacek, just going right down the field. He wanted to make that comeback. Wing right on third and short. Inside handoff, Evan Smith breaks it up the middle and scores the touchdown. To be able to come back on the last drive like that, I think that you build on those moments. Certainly we did as a team, and I absolutely did as a quarterback. The holdout was hard. I got to camp that Wednesday before that first game. Wednesday. I remember it so vividly because usually Jimmy doesn't talk to a holdout for at least two or three weeks. But I wanted to make sure this didn't happen with me. So even one of the passes, I ran right by him and I pow, slapped him right on his tail real hard, you know. And he started laughing. And I said, hey, baby, it's all good. It's all good. I'm back and we're going to get it done. Okay, Michael, that's where to go get it. That's where to go get it, Michael! Team aside, what are your personal goals? How would you like to improve? In every way possible. You know, catch a lot of balls, make me a lot of yards, score a lot of touchdowns. I just want to go out and, you know, be the big pass receiver that I, I think I'm capable of being. I think people mistake selfishness with readiness. I train for tight situations. I train for fourth quarter. I go and run 30, 100-yard sprints with a weight vest on, take the vest off, then put my uniform on and train now. That's fourth quarter training. So when that time came, the game's on the line, it's a big down, a big series, I wanted the ball because I thought I was prepared the most to get the job done. And who do you think it is? Michael Irvin! All right, one more. One more series. One more series. Right, I got you a nice Christmas gift. Maybe something better than that Rolex I got you last year. trying to get it in Dallas where we get a habit of winning. You know, they had it back years ago, but lost it a little bit. We'll get it back. Well, what we're really looking for is speed and quickness. I'd like for you to go as fast as you can go and quick. Quick and more than fast. As fast and quick as you can go. All right, let's go, man. Let's go, man. Let's get geared up, get ready to go. Sharp, sharp. Sprint, sprint, DJ, sprint. Quickness. Get on down there. Get on down there. Move. Move it. Get away from him. Give me quickness. Give me quickness. Quickness. Drive off the back leg. I'm going to explain it once more. I want you to go as fast as you can go. 
There's no substitute for speed. Speed makes up for a lot of things. Sometimes if you can't think as quick, your feet will get you there. All right, all right, DJ! All right, DJ, that's what... Nice quickness. Good. Good quickness there. Good quickness. Hey, you did a hell of a job. Scrimmage yesterday was fantastic. That's exactly the tempo that we want. I had been out of town. I got back in town the day of the supplemental draft. I saw where Dallas did, in fact, get the pick. So immediately, I'm not real happy about that because Steve Walsh was the quarterback for Jimmy at the University of Miami, uh, won a national championship for him. A number of our coaches were, in fact, virtually all of our coaches were from the University of Miami. And immediately, Jimmy had a relationship with someone who was going to be a competitor of mine. And I think that probably, and I think Jimmy would probably tell you the same thing, that in a lot of ways, Jimmy and Mai's relationship got off to a little bit of a difficult start. Forget the fact that we were 1-15 my rookie year, but I think that the acquisition of Steve Walsh kept us from developing a relationship much sooner in my career. He was one of those guys that just comes along once during a career, and uh, we were very fortunate. Plan B free agency was going on in 1990. The Arizona Cardinals were going through a change of coaching staffs, and he somehow got lost in that shuffle. Fortunately for us, we were able to get him. He and I immediately just had this rapport. And of course, he would always have his back to me when he's running a route, coming off the ball. And yet, I always felt that I knew exactly where he was going to be or how he was going to find the hole within the zone. Whatever I was thinking, he seemed to be thinking the same stuff. And so, you know, with that, we were able to develop a tremendous amount of timing that made it nearly impossible for defenders to be able to stop. Caught at the goal line, it's a touchdown! It's a touchdown to Novacek! And defenses had to determine, okay, are we going to double Michael? Are we going to double Jay Novacek? And if we do one or the other with those guys, how do we stop Emmett Smith? And that really was the key to our success, those three guys. We were a team, you knew what we were doing. You still couldn't stop it. Jay Novacek will go up to the DB and say to him, you watch film. He's running 15 yards out and 20 yards in. Could you please stop it? Because if you're covering him, Troy's throwing me the ball. Jay and I would joke back and forth about how could we tell people what we're doing? And they still could not stop it. When it comes time to preparing for a football game, his humor is bad. His patience is bad. He, there's no room for error. There's no room for joking and comedy. It's a big night, guys. Let's start fast and let's compete. 60 minutes. Let's go win on three. One, two, three, win. He's so into, come on, guys, we're messing around too much. Let's stop joking around out here. None of this, man. Come on, guys, we have to get ready. Let's get some points now. Here we go. He's a meticulous guy when it comes to preparing, which, which worked great because we had a bunch of loose guys and we needed our leader to be that way. We needed our main leader to be that way because actually we were probably too loose. And, and he reeled, reeled us right to where we needed to be. I'll talk to him at halftime, you know. Yeah, just... I mean, I've yelled at the guys enough. They, you know, they, they, know, they know me. He's a no-nonsense type of guy. People had problems with Jerry coming to watch practice. I never had a problem with that. I was like, who would not want your boss to come and watch you practice? You see, Kelvin Martin here actually it, it had a, like a nine-yard average on punt returns. Uh, really, Martin, be a good right player, in. right, from Boston College. Yeah. If you're going to practice like a madman, you're going to practice like you're supposed to practice, why would you not want your boss out here watching it? So when you go ask for your money, you're like, hey, man, you see me practice every day. Why would you not want this guy on the football field? He cares about the game. I want a guy, I want to play for a guy that hates losing. I want to play for a guy that it matters. He just wants to win. Jerry wants to win. And ultimately, that's what counts. Down and goal 
less than a yard. Out of the eye, McKellar's tight end motion right. And the handoff to the deep man and a bang at the goal line. Oh, stop it, Pena! Pushed back, he's pushed back, he didn't get in. You all know the defense wins championships. We met in the hole. It was his drive versus my drive. And I knew that all those squats I was doing during the season, all those bench presses, all those reps had to mean something. Kenny Norton, Brad. Kenny Norton makes a huge hit. He makes the play. He started this game by saying that Ken Norton would have to have his name called a lot if the Cowboys are going to be successful. And it's Norton who makes the play. I just grabbed him and I just, I just put my head down and started driving, just started driving. At the same time, I had my hand up inside his face mask. At the, at the time, I think I was just trying to push his face back and kind of cover his eyes so he wouldn't quite know where he was going. It was probably the best tackle, best form tackle that I've ever made. That's a play and a collision that, uh, that I still feel, you know, still today. is imagining this moment right here. Catching a touchdown, it's all of the training, all the times you go running and you're too tired to take another step. All of those moments, all of those nights hurting and crying, yeah, I just did, this was for this. It was just incredible, man. It was an incredible feeling. formation this time. Aikman play action fake, slips, gets up, throws a deep ball. Harper's all alone. Caught it at the five. Touchdown, Cowboys. Oh, what a throw. I don't ever remember having raised the one finger at any time during my career. And I'd seen a lot of guys do that after touchdowns. I'd seen a lot of guys do that after touchdowns in week one, you know, of a regular season. And I just felt that, you know, if you're going to do it, do it when you're number one. And this completion to Alvin Harper looks to have clinched a Cowboys Super Bowl championship. At that moment, I knew we were going to go on and win the ball game and become world champs. It was a great feeling and a great thing to be a part of.